Hello, this is Pastor Jay of Walk and Truth Radio Network. And uh, today I'm going to give you a quick Bible study lesson to kind of help those out who are following us in the book of Judges. And we want to look at Gideon. We want to look at the great Gideon, the great judge, Gideon. We want to look at his attitude. We want to look at his psychological makeup. We want to look at the culture to which he was living at the time. In chapter 6, verse 1 of Judges, it tells us that the man was doing evil in the sight of God. And then God sent his chastisement through another nation. And as I always taught, when you read the Old Testament, you find out that what God does is he sends chastisement through nations that are more wicked, more evil than the evil that his nation is doing. God made a promise to Abraham. His promise to Moses has been fulfilled. But his covenant for Abraham is an everlasting covenant. And his covenant with the people that were during the time of Moses was, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. If you don't obey me, you'll be cursed. He even said that if you continue in that way, he would drive you out the land. So in Judges, we see the progression of the nation of Israel as they begin to apostatize, meaning turn away from God and follow other gods looking for a king. And I'm saying looking for a king. So in the book of Judges, in the story of Gideon, we have a pivotal point that will come later that the people of Israel, after the victory, wants Gideon to be their king. And he says the correct and the right thing that is motivated by the Holy Spirit. He said, the Lord will rule over you. Now, I want you to pay attention to that and stick a pen in it. OK, so let's look at verse chapter six. Let's pick it up what Gideon was doing in verse 6 and 11 say, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizanite, while his son Gideon, now watch this, his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon is a part of the culture of the chastisement of God, the Midianites would come and just basically wipe out the land, wipe out their crops every year. They were Ishmaelites. Now, pay attention to that. They were Ishmaelites. So they were relatives. They were relatives, but they had become wicked. And the Ishmaelites will always be a thorn in the children of Israel's uh, side. And at this point in time, we have the Midianites coming along and just decimating the land every harvest season. So Gideon being very practical, being scared, being concerned, wanting to feed his family and his clan, instead of, of, of pressing out the wheat on a hill where the wind would blow, they would throw it up and then the good part would fall to the ground and the chaff would blow away. He's in a place where there's no wind and he's trying to beat out the wheat. So he's probably working three times as hard to get the job done, but he's being practical. He is hiding from the chastisement of God. He is hiding to naturally feed his family, which is a good thing. He is obviously smart. He's obviously cunning. He's going to be in a place where they least expect it, doing something to preserve his family. So he's in the wine press, hiding from the Midianites, beating out the wheat. And the angel of the Lord, which is Yahweh, uh, capital L-O-R-D, appeared to him and said to him, quote, The Lord Yahweh is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, you're hiding and the Lord decides to call you and summon you and say something about you that you don't see in yourself. He calls Gideon a mighty man of valor. Now, I can imagine at that time, if I am hiding in the wine press and I'm scared, my, if someone came to me that I didn't know and called me a mighty man of valor, I would be very skeptical of that claim. Even if they say the Lord has called me. Again, he says, the Lord is with you. So now what you're saying is the Lord is amongst, is with me. The Lord is next to me, the Lord has come along beside me and the Lord has addressed me as a mighty man of valor. 
Gideon acts in a very normal, practical way. Let's not, let's not deify Gideon. He says, and Gideon said to him, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, now he, he puts himself as part of the whole nation of Israel. Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Now you think about this. That, that, that's a very logical question. If, if God is with me, then how can it be that the Israelites are in such a bad situation where we have to go back to 6 and 1, where it tells us that they had done what was evil in the sight of God. Quite fascinating. When, when we do evil, we never want to go back to recognizing the situation we're in is, is directly related to our disobedience. I want to say that again. When we do evil, we do not trace it back to our disobedience. So Gideon is wondering, well, he bought us out of Egypt. So why hasn't he shown himself to deliver us now? What have we done? Or I don't believe to understand what we have done to deserve this kind of chastisement. Well, uh, Gideon is very familiar with the fact that the Lord had told them that they were not to worship any other gods. And that the minute they do so, they were going to be chastised. If they continued it, they will be removed from the land. God also told them uh, not to intermarry with the other nations. They had already started that process. So they had been evil, uh, had been, and basically it goes to the point where it tells them uh, in chapter 17, everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. They did not destroy the nations that they were supposed to in Joshua's time. And God said that there will be this thorn in their side. There, there will be these nations that would linger around, that would give them trouble and would be his rod of correction on them because they didn't trust him. They didn't follow him and they did not adhere to the Mosaic covenant that he had gave Moses to come into the land of milk and honey. And also you have to remember, it was told to them that every year that they would read from the Torah to get re-familiar with it, to understand it, to begin to tell each generation about what God required of them, they had begun to walk away. So at this point in time, there's no reverence for God's word, there's no leader, and then there's a chastisement from their disobedience. When there's no word of God in you or being taught to you, then you're more likely to be disobedient because you simply don't know it and you forgot about it. You may know bits and parts, but you don't know what God has required of you. And as time goes on, your conscience begins to sear in your disobedience and you just disregard the word of God. You might know it, but you will walk away from the word of God. Let's look at uh, Romans. Let's see what happens in uh, Romans chapter one. So go to Romans chapter one. Go to Romans chapter one. Go to Romans chapter one. And... Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 121. For although they knew God, Gideon did, they did not honor him as God. That's when they be began to worship other gods other than the God of God of Israel. Or give thanks to him. See, Gideon didn't give thanks. He was wondering why hasn't God performed? But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. When you are disobedient to God on a continuous basis, that's what I mean by the searing of your conscience. They describe it, Paul describes it now as your heart being darkened. Who do you think he was talking about? They knew God, the Israelites. They had a relationship with God. They were given the oracles of God. And this is one thing I want you to put a pen in, in your mind. Just because you have the word in front of you, just because you walk, go to church, doesn't mean that you're saved and doesn't mean that you know God. That's an inside out thing and you have to pray to God 
that he will reveal himself to you. God is a revelatory God. He reveals himself to whom he wills. And if you're in church and you have a desire, God wants to give you the gift of the revelation of who he is. But you have to be taught it. It doesn't come just because you want it. It becomes evident through teaching and preaching of the word of God. The faith in God. Faith come by hearing. Hearing come by the word of God. This is not a thing of performance. This is a, a, a relationship that you will have with the true and living God, which is Jesus Christ. But at this time, just like then, just like now, there's no relationship with God going on with the children of Israel because of their disobedience. And they became fools. And they became fools in their, in their thinking. Verse uh, 122. It says, now this is what they claim. Claim to be wise. Do what was right in your own eyes. They became fools. Okay? And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling what? Mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. How many of you know that anything that you put as a symbol or a representative of God that is made by God's man's hands or represents that something that God has made, you create an idol. By then, they had begun to worship not only uh, Yahweh, but they also began to worship the gods of the nations they began to amalgamate into, meaning the nations they became friendly with, the nations that they married into. Just like with Solomon, God warned him and said, if you start intermarrying the women from the other nations, you will love them enough that they will turn your heart from God. Well, as the nation of Israel began to marry into the other nations and seek to be with the nations they were supposed to conquer, they didn't turn the nations to Israel. They didn't turn the nations to, to God or Yahweh. That The nations, because of their flesh, turned the people away. So in a city that was supposed to be for God and God only, you not only had the temple or the things of God, but you also had right beside it, right in front of it, where everybody could see the Asheroth and the idols of Baal. And Baal had many different gods. So you may go to one region, it will be Moloch. In another region, it may be somebody else. But it was truly idolistic. Okay? And God promised them that if they began to worship other gods, that he would chastise them. Now, this is way in Rome. This is almost 2,000 years later. Paul is explaining what happened to them. Therefore, God gave them up. Gave them up. God gave them up. God is going to, has given Gideon up. They have reached a point where God has given them up to their own hearts, to the lust of their own hearts. So he allowed them to do what um, they wanted to do. Oftentimes, God is so concerned about your progress, he will let you go passively into a direction you're not supposed to go, hopingly that the little light that you have will turn you around and bring you back. But as we see with the nation of Israel, Gideon and the nation of Israel kept falling into darkness, okay? Kept falling into apostasy. Apostasy is simply knowing the truth and moving in the opposite direction. Okay, but the Bible promised in the in the book of uh, God promised in the book of Judges that every time the judge, long as the judge lived, God was with Israel. So Israel went through this yo-yo period of time. The judges last approximately three hundred plus years of this back and forth till they get to the full apostasy before they get to Samuel and he gives them a king, and he tells them again. He tells uh, tells them, did not the Lord? Now, 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 now watch this. Instead of Gideon humble himself, he asked a question. You know, where is God? Where is the God that delivered our fathers out of Egypt that had done all these great things? It says, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of the Midianites. That's at the end of verse 13. So what he does is ask a question to the angel of the Lord. And then he says, where is God? Because what, what has happened now, he must have forsaken us. Now, what, what Gideon is, is, is actually espousing to is that God has turned his back on them. God has walked away from them and blessed the Midianites. And every time, it's just like a good parent. When our parents chastise us, 
we feel that there's a turning because the chastisement is painful. We feel that they have abandoned us. They hate us. You know, we, we were immature. We, they hated us. They didn't like us because they chastised us. We didn't know the scripture says God chastises those he loves. So chastisement is a form of love. And we have to keep that in our mind. Make sure you understand that when God is chastising you, he loves you. A lot of times when God is not answering your prayers, but somehow or another you are still surviving and being blessed, it's because others are praying for you. Don't think that God, you're getting away with sin. It's because others have prayed and are praying for you. And God has taken into consideration their prayers for you. So if you, even if you don't have the relationship with God, you will honor the people that's praying for you and turn from your wicked ways. Verse 14. <clears throat> and the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hands of Midian. Do not I send you. So God says, gives him a directive. He says, now you go in this might that I've given you, the favor that I've given you. Not favor that he's made up on himself, but now God has infused him with what he needs. When God appoints you or calls you, he also equips you. So what he just told Gideon is, I found favor on you, not because you did anything good, not because you're so holy. As we're going to see, Gideon is just like everybody else. And I, and, and I want to tell you guys this. The prophet is one of the people too. Okay? The prophet, the priest, the pastor, the evangelist, they are one of the fallen two. God sovereignly chooses them not because of their merit, but because of their will. So we need to stop idolizing those who God has chosen to do his work. They are deserve a ear. They deserve to be respected, but they do not need to be put on a pedestal as if they're the only connection to God. They are given an assignment to be God's voice in a land at that moment. And that may not be forever. Your job is to idolize the God that was gracious enough to pick a wretch like them, a person like them. And when God picking them, this is when you can come into your mind. If God has used them, he can also use me because that person that he picked is no spe more special than I am. They're a sinner saved by grace just like the I am. So God graciously chooses who he's going to use. I'm going to say that again. God graciously chooses who he's going to use. And sometimes God chooses the, the base things of this world to confound the wise. So the worse you are, you actually have the slot to be chosen by God so God can get the glory. So he tells him, I send you. And I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there for a second. We see a young man named Gideon who is scared. Because the nation is being oppressed by the Midianites due to their disobedience. We see a man who is, is being chosen by God. But has some uh, trepidation about God's presence with him. But God appoints him and tells him, I've shown favor on you. That the might that you're going to have that's in you is given to me. And go. Now, what you'll find out with most people who are called by God for these assignments, there's that hesitation throughout the Bible. Or can you really be choosing me for this? He told Paul, I'm going to show you much how much you must suffer for my sake. Um, there is a burden of suffering when God chooses you. That's why I don't understand why everybody wants to be chosen. Because there is a burden if God is really choosing you. You will come to know the burden of that choice. But because God has equipped you, you will be able to go forward in that choice and achieve God's outcome by staying obedient. Now, yielding to what God says. At some point, Gideon has to yield. But God is patient with us. Most leaders are reluctant. And as we're going to see, Gideon wants sign after sign after sign of God's not ability to do what he said but God being with him Gideon's biggest problem is 
he believes God has forsaken him. And I want to say some of your biggest problems is through your obedience and the chastisement, you believe that God has forsaken you and God has not forsaken you. So as we continue to go through the book of Judges, we'll unpack more of Gideon's story that even though you may win the battle, you if you walk away from God, if your mind becomes unfocused, you will slip back to idolatry and put the nation and your family in a position of being chastised. So I hope this short lesson has been encouraged, encouraging to somebody. Uh, you can contact me at W-I-T-M-I-N at Yahoo.com. Pastor J. Sutton the second on WhatsApp. Uh, you can also comment on our Walk and Truth Radio uh, Christian Fellowship Facebook page or my personal page also. Or Let Us Reason Together Facebook page. And then you can also check us out on Walk and Truth Radio Network YouTube. I always want you to be encouraged, be blessed, and be at peace. And I hope this lesson on, in Gideon has motivated you to understand it's okay to be scared. You might even feel forsaken, but God said he would never leave you nor forsaken you. And the fact that you're being chastised should let you know God loves you. Peace. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast of Walk in Truth Radio Network. If you'd like to partner with us with a donation, please go and look at the description box for many ways to donate. You want to thank you in advance and continue to be blessed.